Central and South America is arguably a decisive region in today's strategic competitions with authoritarian actors. For example, the People's Republic of China is doing things like investing in critical infrastructure across the region, including strategically useful ports, as well as cyber and space facilities that could be used by Beijing's civilian and military agencies. Russia continues its support of authoritarian and malign actors across the region, including through disinformation campaigns. And those are only part of the strategic challenges to the United States that are emanating from that region. Migration, transnational criminal organizations, illegal fishing, all of these are on the agenda of United States Southern Command. I'm Dr. Kathleen McGinnis, the director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative, and my colleague, Carrie, I'm joined by my colleague, Carrie Bingen, um, the director of the Aerospace Security Project at CSIS. We are delighted to welcome General Laura Richardson, the commander of United States Southern Command, to CSIS today to talk about her perspective on what's happening down south. Carrie? General Richardson is an Army aviator flying Black Hawk helicopters. She's trained soldiers. She's deployed into Iraq and Afghanistan in combat. She's seen policymaking at the highest levels of the White House and understands the role of Congress. I was fortunate to meet her first while she was in the key role of legislative liaison, where she built relationships with members of Congress who established policy and, importantly, fund the Army. Uh, and I also got to meet her again uh, during her deployment to Afghanistan, where I saw her lead in a very complex and challenging security environment. So I can think of no better leader than General Richardson to tackle these tough issues and strengthen our relationships in the region. It really is a privilege to have you today. Well, thank you very much. It's my honor to be here and have the opportunity to be able to, to talk about the uh, the great opportunities that we have in the Western Hemisphere, mm -hmm. talk to you about the, uh, what this region has to offer, the great partners that we have and the, and the work that we do with our allies in the region as well, and uh, just be able to share some of that, but also the security challenges that I think that uh, if we partner better together and bring uh, the entire whole of government together uh, to bear, as I say, uh, with all the instruments of national power for Team USA, that we have a great shot of promoting uh, and continuing to be at the forefront with team democracy in the Western mm -hmm. Hemisphere. Yeah. I get, yeah. So to start off our conversation, we'd like to get a sense of people's origin stories, right? So what inspired you to join the military? And also, what over the years has inspired you to stay in the military with this extraordinary career? Well, I think the uh, my folks had a lot to do with me joining the military in the first place. And I think the uh, uh, I was an athlete growing up, and uh, all of us kids were. I'm the oldest of four. Uh, I have two sisters and a brother. And athletics was part of our life from uh, being very small kids. So. Um, and that translated very nicely into, uh, into the military. But then uh, also uh, I had an aspiration for flying and uh, was able to uh, uh, go into ROTC uh, and advance that by uh, being commissioned into the aviation branch in the United States Army. And so uh, what an opportunity. I mean, yeah. you can't make it up what you get to do in the military. And that's why I really like to talk about all the, all the great things that you get to do because I couldn't have picked – uh, what the Army has provided uh, mm -hmm. for me and allowed me to be able to do. Uh, but to be able to be a helicopter pilot, uh, to be able to go and travel the world, seriously be <laughs> able to go everywhere. <laughs> and, uh, and you've seen, you've seen great things mm -hmm. and you see uh, where you can help where things are not so great uh, in other countries and things like that. And, uh, and just uh, as I talk about team democracy, you be able to uh, help with that, and that's what's so powerful. It's the soft power about team democracy, about democracy, and really what that means uh, for our globe, and I think that it's um, hugely important right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, the, the contest with authoritarian actors and the way that, you know, the, the stakes are becoming so clear. Well, and, and I guess that, that leads me to my next question. What what is, for our, the benefit of our viewers, um, what, what is Southcom? What, what are your priorities? Um, how, how is the, the command's area response? But how are you interacting with the region? And, and um, what do you see 
uh, as priorities for moving forward? This region is, uh, is, is um, there's so many things that come to mind, yeah. uh, but it is very powerful. I mean, in our national security strategy from President Biden, uh, this hemisphere, uh, there is no other hemisphere that uh, is inextricably linked to our homeland like the Western Hemisphere. And the importance of the region uh, cannot be overstated enough. Mm -hmm. But the proximity, number one, but all of the resources, this hemisphere is very rich in natural resources, rare earth elements, uh, climate. Uh, you talk about the Amazon. Eight countries have the Amazon in these countries. Mm -hmm lungs of the world that we, uh, I don't think, still fully appreciate. Um, and uh, quite honestly, I think the, also in Colombia, that was my most recent trip, uh, talking about um, where we, and this is something that uh, a very wise person told me while I was there, you know, we need to start respecting Mother Nature as not someone mm -hmm. that's below us, but someone that's either at par with us or uh, of a higher being. Mm -hmm. Because if we lose the Amazon, uh, that will impact the world, all of us uh, as the lungs of the world. But rare earth elements, lithium triangle, 60% um, of the world's lithium is in this region. Hmm. Gold, copper, we see significant illegal mining, uh, illegal logging, deforestation, mm -hmm. uh, all of these criminal elements that are happening in this region. And so um, and what we try to do is uh, work with our partner nations as well as our allies. We have allies and partners throughout our national security strategy and our national defense strategy working with our allies and partners, we do nothing alone. We do it as partners. Mm -hmm. And again, I talk about team democracy because as we think about uh, the 28 like-minded democracies in the region, uh, partnering together, that's really our strongest defense about, mm -hmm. uh, against malign activity in the region. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can dive into that a bit further and ask you to talk more about what that strategic environment looks like in your area of responsibility, the key focus in our national security strategy right now, it's strategic competition with China. We tend to think of that as an Indo-Pacific regional challenge, but China has global reach. So what are you seeing in your area, in the countries that you deal with on a daily basis? Well, thanks for that, Carrie, because the absolutely, it is absolutely global and right under our nose and so close to our homeland. I'd like to say what the PRC is doing, the People's Republic of China. Uh, it looks to be investment, uh, but really I call it extraction at mm -hmm. the end of the day. And uh, I say that it's in the red zone, uh, just to use um, uh, you know, an analogy there. Uh, mm -hmm. They're on the 20-yard line to our homeland, or we could say that they're on the first and second island chain to our homeland. And the proximity in terms of this region and the importance of the region, I think that we have to truly appreciate uh, what this region brings and the security challenges that, uh, that these countries face. Now, China isn't at the top of the list as a, as a pacing challenge or an adversary to the countries. Transnational criminal organizations are. Mm -hmm. uh, but as I uh, talk about the, and educate and inform our partners uh, in terms of what I see from U.S. Southern Command, because I think we're in a very uh, unique position to be able to put together all of the things that are happening in the region and be able to present that. Mm -hmm. uh, countries make their own decision. They are sovereign countries, and we respect that, absolutely. They make their own decisions, but uh, I always try to make sure that they have all the facts because they aren't uh, sometimes presented all the facts, and we have that mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, uh, as another democracy. Um, I see these authoritarian regimes using democracy to get elected and then uh, use that position to dismantle democracy. And so we have to show how we align with the priorities uh, uh, as nations go through democratic processes and changes, free and fair elections, if those are free and fair elections, then we're going to figure out how we work with those uh, administrations. And what we find, uh, especially, especially in the security realm, is a lot of things that we do align with our, you know, our new administration's priorities uh, mm. in the hemisphere. And so we just have to explain that and show that, uh, the advantages that uh, that, that has. But in terms of the critical infrastructure that the PRC is investing in the hemisphere, it's all the crit critical yeah. infrastructure. And when you look at that and present it, it's in the deep water ports, it's mm -hmm. in space, most space uh, enabling infrastructure by the Chinese, it's in the, ha uh, in the globe, is in my hemisphere, is in my Southcom area of operations. Uh, you, 5G technology, mm -hmm. um, five countries have the, the, the PRC backbone for mm -hmm. 5G. 
24 countries have PRC uh, 3G or 4G backbone. Hmm. And so um, what usually comes to happen is they're offered almost a zero, uh, zero cost upgrade uh, mm -hmm. yeah. to the 5G. And so it's really hard for these leaders that are in the seat, usually one term of four years, uh, they're working on a stopwatch, not a calendar. And mm -hmm. we have to be able to have alternative methods, alternative companies, alternative options for them to be able to select to the Chinese competitors. And that's where we're getting out competed by the Chinese right now. And that's a playbook that we're seeing in the rest of the world, too. Yeah. So thanks for highlighting that in the Latin American region in particular, because it doesn't seem like we are paying enough attention to that. Mm -hmm. Can I, you, you hit on something as well on space that I, I'd really like to get to as, as I lead the aerospace security team here at CSIS. So you just returned from a trip to South America with NASA Administrator Bill Nelson, Senator Bill Nelson. And, and as you mentioned, space is another area of that competition that we're in with the People's Republic of China. What was the purpose of your trip? What reflections do you take back with you? And, and how was your and Administrator Nelson's message received down in the region? Well, I think it was, uh, it was, um, it was a, a game changer for me. It was mm -hmm. such a great opportunity uh, for Administrator Nelson to travel in the region. And he has traveled as a senator. He has traveled with many other Southcom commanders uh, before into the region, and we spoke about that. But I had invited him to the, to the region about five months ago. Uh, and when I was talking to him about the, the uh, PRC uh, space enabling infrastructure that's already in the hemisphere, with more planned uh, for that number to increase. And, uh, and so uh, he scheduled a trip, went to Brazil, met with President Lula on the collaboration. Brazil's already a uh, has signed up uh, as a member of the Artemis Accords. He traveled to Argentina met with President Fernandez there, uh, and they signed the, uh, Argentina signed the Artemis Accord while he was there, and then to Colombia, and I met the administrator in Colombia for his visit there, and uh, last year the uh, uh, country of Colombia had signed the Artemis Accord. But being able to, uh, in, in terms of Colombia's um, case, they have, uh, all of these countries have uh, uh, huge space programs and uh, having our NASA administrator be able to come there and talk about more collaboration, what mm -hmm. NASA is doing, what they are doing, how can we collaborate better together. I mean, it's really, we are only limited by the ideas that we come up with of how we can collaborate better together. And as I look at that, that's part of what the power of team democracy brings. And that's how we outcompete our adversaries mm -hmm. is like-minded democracies working together, uh, on collaborative ideas to make things happen. Uh, in Colombia's case, one of the uh, top priorities of President Petro is climate change. Mm -hmm. And so space has a, a number of different things that are going on uh, to help countries identify problems from space with agriculture, for example. And so uh, as you think of uh, the drought corridor in this region, a thousand mile drought corridor, you're talking about food insecurity. How can we change that? How can we change disease and crops, identify it? Deforestation, uh, which uh, impacts uh, the Amazon and the lungs of the world and being able to uh, achieve carbon neutrality, right? Mm -hmm. Colombia and the U.S. want to achieve uh, being carbon neutral by 2050. I mean, how do you achieve all this? But from space, you can identify all of these things mm -hmm. uh, on the ground that are happening and help these countries uh, counter the illegal mining that can mm -hmm. be seen from space, the illegal logging that's impacting the Amazon. And so we also went to see a project uh, in Cali, Colombia, that was um, an effort with NASA and USAID uh, uh, to get after exactly this. Five years that this program has been uh, in place. And then also in Cali is Columbia's um, Aerospace Force Operations Center. Mm -hmm. And uh, President Petro had just renamed this earlier this week the Colombian Air Force to the Colombian Aerospace Force. Mm -hmm. And so just to see all the initiatives. They don't have a commercial space program yet in Colombia, mm -hmm. just a military program. And mm -hmm. so um, obvi obviously opportunities uh, yeah. with NASA for possibly uh, a civilian space agency. And then also uh, Administrator Nelson offered to train as part of the international program that NASA has, train and put into space a Colombian astronaut. Wow. So um, uh, as part of that international program. And so uh, certainly I'm sure that would be that would be available to Brazil and Argentina too because they're part of the Artemis Accords. So 
Uh, I, that again. just seems ripe for partnerships. <laughs> I there. know, right? <laughs> um, exactly. So really excited about that. Uh, changing the subject a bit, um, fentanyl. Uh, it's involved in an increasing number of deaths of Americans under 50, and as a result, is becoming a national security concern for many policymakers and legislators. Um, what is your assessment of Southcom's activities to combat illicit trafficking, and including fentanyl? Well, I think we have a great, uh, a great template for success, and that's with um, our component command, our, our JTF, which is uh, Joint Interagency Task Force South, mm -hmm. or better known as JIAD of South. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and really, where we have um, over 16 uh, whole of government uh, interagency folks that are embedded in that headquarters, as well mm -hmm. as in US Southcom. They have over 20 foreign liaison officers that are also in Jayad of South. I have a complement of about 16. And really, when you get that synergy together to work right there um, mm -hmm. in operations and be able to, we do the detection and monitoring of illicit uh, traffics, uh, mm -hmm. traffic, drug trafficking heading uh, to the United States. And so, uh, and then we turn that information over to law enforcement and or partner nations. And so, mm -hmm. Our partner nations in the hemisphere are able to, uh, their, their percentages of interdictions and disruptions mm -hmm. uh, have gone up in this past year, 76%. Really? So wow. if we can see it, mm -hmm. uh, they have, uh, they can't see everything, but if we can point to where there is activity and mm -hmm. where they can make a, a finish on a law enforcement for a disruption or interdiction, they absolutely go after it. And mm -hmm. so, but... I think we have the template for that, uh, the fentanyl crisis, and certainly uh, in the hemisphere that I have, uh, cocaine. Um, uh, we can't interdict our way out of this problem, though. And yeah. so it's very important that we go after, uh, go after the money, uh, all of those things that contribute, that whole of government process that follows the money, and they're able to go after the drug labs as well. It's really mm -hmm. important because if you're just getting the the little semi-submersible that has, mm -hmm. yeah, it has some kilograms of cocaine on it, maybe some marijuana. But the thing is, is that's not going to stop the problem. You got to get after the bigger uh, things, and that's exactly what we're doing. Um, but we can also um, always use, I think, with uh, with this uh, great uh, command that we have of Jayad of South, is um, is be able to get after that problem. We have to keep continue to do that and build relationships to do, to do that. I mean, looking forward. Um, in addition to, you know, looking at the upstream effects and, and, um, or, or actors, right, and, and getting at the bigger sources of financing, um, where do you think, in addition to that, Southcom ought to be prioritizing its efforts looking forward when it comes to narco-trafficking and countering narcotics? Yep. So I think the uh, uh, continuing to partner with our partner nations, being able to expand our reach, mm -hmm. uh, being able to... Um, uh, Identify barriers to outcompete amongst the interagency and the whole of government, okay. and being able to bring those um, those things that are needed to change. I think that that's, you know, when you're at the tip of the spear, it's really important. And uh, you know, the uh, as you both know, uh, to inform uh, our Congress, if there are barriers to out to outcompete or what are keeping us from actually achieving things, or mm -hmm. or the interagency team, Team USA, being able to do that, or Team Democracy. It's important that we be able to identify those barriers to outcompete. Mm -hmm. But being able to see innovative ideas of how to go out after building networks with low cost, high return on investment types of uh, uh, capabilities that are out there. That's why I try to speak to uh, uh, industry uh, as well, because mm -hmm. with the technology that's being uh, developed today, there are a lot of things out there with AI and ML that you're able to utilize that helps you uh, put these uh, networks together mm -hmm. and be able to counter them, whether uh, through Team USA or Team Democracy with our partner nations. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, given your, your background working in Afghanistan, I mean, are, you, are you bringing some of those lessons learned or those sorts of insights into the, your, your approach to countering narcotics? Because you know, both, both areas have significant counter narcotics problems. Right, it's, um, absolutely. Yeah. And so uh, being able to share the information, the intelligence sharing, the information sharing, having those sharing agreements in place. And then that's where we get to, uh, you know, uh, having 
uh, a 3G, 4G, or 5G network backbone that you can share the information on that is not a uh, PRC uh, network that we know has backdoors into Mm -hmm. being able to get uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, information that we don't want the Chinese to have, uh, Mm -hmm. absolutely. So the... Um, we've got to be able to uh, continue with those sharing agreements and continue with uh, being able to work very seamlessly with our partners. And, and thank you for making that point. Um, I think with Huawei, uh, the the actual national security implications, what it actually means in terms of brass tacks, it's kind of gets lost in, in, in the discussion. So thank you for illuminating that for us. Um, to, I'd like to turn to another um, <laughs> thorny issue, to put it mildly, <laughs> um, migration and illegal migration. Um, it's migration from countries in your area of responsibility is putting pressure on U.S. southern borders. Um, many observers, therefore, think that Southcom should be playing a leading role in contending with the migration challenge. But the Southcom area of responsibility ends at the southern Mexican border. Um, and many of the root causes of population migration, they're due to non-military issues like poor governance, national dis- natural disasters, lack of economic opportunity, those sorts of things. Um, so with that background in mind, I'd love to know your thoughts on how how should we be, how should Southcom and how should we be thinking about the issue of migration and that nexus between security and migration. So um, I'll answer your question in two parts, Kathleen, but amazing question because the uh, we're doing a lot actually in Southcom. And uh, and so the uh, in terms of the migration, so in mm-hmm. April I traveled with Secretary Marcus and uh, Samantha Power from USAID to Panama. And that was to bring Colombia and Panama and the United States together to sign a trilateral agreement. First, it was to present the the idea of the trilateral agreement, and then to uh, get an agreement mm-hmm. and sign it. And uh, and all three of us actually did that day on the 11th of April, and uh, and that was uh, three pillars. There was a security pillar. Uh, there was a legal pathways pillar on how mm-hmm. we. Uh, Samantha Power said it best. Um, everybody knows how to get in touch with a smuggler uh, to um, to get across the Darien jungle, uh, but no one knows how to, not too many know how to get to, where do you sign up for League of Pathways? How do you achieve that? Right, yeah. And so that's the second pillar, and then the mm-hmm. third pillar was development, and it was in communities around, uh, uh, around the Darien jungle, and so that's what we're really uh, in tune with, uh, with the uh, uh, Colombia and Panama, and um, and the dangers of crossing through that uh, very expansive and very dangerous jungle. And so, on the security pillar, uh, since uh, the end of April, Colombia and Panama, uh, Colombian military and the Panamanian public security forces have been conducting uh, operations, security operations, to go after the transnational criminal organizations mm-hmm. who are doing the human smuggling. Okay. And those operations have been very successful. Uh, as I said, I was in Colombia earlier this week and received an updated briefing from Colombia on their Operation Hefesto, uh, which they have been, they have 23,500 uh, Colombian military that are involved in this operation. It's the entire military. It's the Army, Navy, and Air Force that are uh, conducting operations. And they're being very successful on mm-hmm. the security side of the house. Now, they aren't going after, uh, the, the intent is not for the, the security forces going after the migrant the migrants. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's to go over uh, or go after the, the smugglers and the, the, the human trafficking uh, piece of that. Mm-hmm. In addition, what they're finding is they're being successful with all of other things um, in terms of the counter-narcotics, uh, the illegal mining, the illegal logging. All of these countries in the hemisphere are dealing with all of these security challenges. And so um, the uh, just had a trilateral meeting with Panama uh, Minister of Public Security, Colombian Minister of Defense, uh, and myself, and uh, we just conducted that about a month ago. Uh, I was in Panama for that one, and we uh, we were supposed to go to the Darien, but the weather was too bad to get in there with the with the helicopters, so we did it uh, virtually. And then uh, we continue to have those engagements. I routinely talk to Panama, Colombia uh, uh, ministries and also the military and public security forces weekly. And um, that's, 
uh, being successful. But again, Mm -hmm. it's three pillars that come together. It's part of that whole of government. Mm -hmm. And so that's why segueing into, um, you know, all of the things that are causing migration. There are Mm -hmm. families on the move, people on the move at all time highs. And the prediction by 2050 is it's just uh, going to continue to increase. Mm-hmm. When you think of not being able to get health care, food, security is, uh, is uh, security and instability. And this is how I see what the transnational criminal organizations do. They, make, they stir the pot, make things very insecure. They scare the populations. And then that allows uh, China to come in mm-hmm. with their Belt and Road Initiative to look like it's uh, economic recovery and those sorts of things. I go back to these leaders are only in the seat usually for one term, four mm-hmm. years. They're working on the stopwatch, not the calendar. Mm-hmm. They need help now, uh, not in two or three yeah. years. And some of our processes from Team USA are slow. Mm-hmm. And so we're really been pressurizing those systems, identifying the barriers to outcompete that are keeping, uh, as I say, blocking Team USA's own field goals. You know, Mm. what is not allowing me to be, you know, instantaneous or pretty quick in delivery? Mm -hmm. And then uh, working with the whole of government. So I went to, um, uh, as part of the instruments of national power for Team USA, diplomats, information, military, which is what I do, the security cooperation, which is my main lever, uh, working with our partners, conducting conferences, conducting uh, exercises where I can bring uh, 20 over 20 partner nations together we've had five exercises in the region uh, over this past month five of them at the same time in different places mm-hmm. Guyana with trade winds Colombia hosting uh, UNITAS the 64th year we've had that maritime exercise Southern Star uh, special operations exercise in Chile uh, uh, Resolute Sentinel which is uh, uh, Colombia uh, Peru and Ecuador, uh, two and a half month exercise, and all of these bring partner nations, over 20 together. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that's the military side of it. And then to finish it off, dime uh, mm-hmm. is economics, the E part that you mentioned, Kathleen. And this is where I see that we can, we can uh, raise the profile of companies that are already investing in the hemisphere but then also double down on what's out there for the projects. These countries are really hurting from COVID. They are still digging out from COVID. And when you talk about 8% to 18% drop in GDP for some of these countries, Panama was 18. Uh, It's huge, over 200 million thrown into poverty in the region. They are digging out and they're having a hard time doing it. Uh, And so we've got to be there. Team USA, Team Democracy, Western Solutions, U.S. Solutions. Um, But what is keeping companies, U.S. companies, from competing on tenders uh, for these countries? Contracts. What what are the barriers? Because Mm -hmm. when there are only six Chinese companies uh, that are competing on a tender, why is that? Right. What is happening? Something's happening. And we have to get Western solutions, uh, U.S. solutions, um, uh, dem- democratic solutions on the economic side because there, there's, there are barriers out there, and that's why I mentioned Senator Menendez's bill, Senator Cassidy's bill. Uh, there, there are initiatives out there to make a difference um, with uh, how we are able to invest with the region and be good partners. This is part of our hemisphere. These are our neighbors. Uh, Their success, as I go back to our national security strategy that I I completely uh, think is right on target, is uh, inextricably linked. Our security in the United States is inextricably linked to the to the security of the of this hemisphere. Well, and as and as you mentioned, you know the what is security is so much more broad because the game is being played by our by other actors in the information space in um, economic space, and, and that's not necessarily the, the place where the United States um, right. is, is best prepared to yeah. act, right? Well, exactly, I wanted to tee off that as yeah. well and dive in to exactly that. I mean, I remember being at the Pentagon, Southcom never fared well in terms of assets and resource priorities, so you have to be much more creative with your mm-hmm. toolkit that isn't always military. I mean, it is very much soft power and those other mm-hmm. el- elements, diplomatic, information, economic, right. So, so how are you approaching that in the region? Well, thank you, Carrie. So the, um, we've been on a full court press uh, to um, talk about Team USA mm-hmm. and the branding 
And uh, my meeting with Secretary Blinken uh, in the spring at City Summit of the Americas in Denver, Colorado. And then uh, I went to meet with uh, Secretary Armando of Commerce. And we get our uh, commerce liaison <coughs> officer in Southcom this month. I'm so excited to get that. Fantastic. But, uh, Congratulations. <laughs> uh, she had a great idea, the Secretary of Commerce. And, and I pitched to her if, if she would uh, consider coming to the Western Hemisphere. She said, I'm coming uh, to Panama. And uh, we ended up traveling together a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic. And that was uh, 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 with the announcement of President Biden that Panama was selected as one of the seven uh, partners for the U.S. to partner with on semiconductor supply chain. And so mm -hmm. Panama is, a, is an emerging leader in the region with so much promise uh, on this initiative, and then also Costa Rica and uh, their ability to be one of those seven countries as well. But this is exactly what we're talking about. How do we uh, get more investment, raise the profile of our, our very important countries that are doing huge uh, great things democratically as part of team democracy. I mean, you can't, uh, you can't make a, an argument any stronger than that. But we have to continue full court press, press to bring all of the instruments of national power. And I think that that's what the Chinese do so well mm -hmm. with the Belt and Road Initiative. They do it with these huge economic pro, uh, projects. And I'm talking like billion, when they sign on, countries sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative, it's usually for billions of yeah. dollars of projects. And it can be done so quickly. And they mm -hmm. can do it so quickly. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the things, is, uh, as uh, we were talking earlier, um, uh, that there's a little bit of buyer's remorse. There are examples mm -hmm. in this uh, mm -hmm. region, not just uh, as well as globally, mm -hmm. for sure, where projects have not gone well, design mm -hmm. flaws, cost overruns, uh, huge delays. And uh, these countries, uh, you know, uh, now they're having the buyer's remorse. But again, as someone put to me earlier this week, you know, when you are desperate for uh, help, you're going to turn to whoever's there. Someone throws you a rope, you don't necessarily look at who's giving you the rope. You just mm -hmm. grab it. Mm -hmm. And so we need to have alternatives to uh, the PRC. And if we're not there competing, then uh, they're going to choose. They're, yeah. It's not a matter of a choice. They're going to they're gonna have to take it. Yeah. I mean, you take whatever life raft is available. Right. Right. Um, can I shift gears? Uh, go. I want to. Well, it's related to this as well. But maritime domain awareness, I want to hit on, um, which I know Southcom has a tremendous uh, role in. Uh, we have incredible interns here at CSIS who will go into careers in national security. And one of our interns this summer, Callista Jones from Georgia Tech, uh, posed a question on MDA that I want to present to you, which is when you're looking at the area of responsibility assigned to Southcom, it is clear to see the need for maritime domain awareness. Can you talk about Southcom activities in this area? And then tying back into the space discussion, do you see a near future where space and satellite data, thinking about some of the capabilities of these, these new, uh, new space companies that can move fast, do you see a role where they can aid Southcom in its objectives to bolster maritime yeah, domain awareness absolutely. in the region? Absolutely. So um, just the ability to see in this huge uh, area of operations, uh, when you're talking about the Caribbean, Central America, and South America, huge. And so to be able to see, and our partners want to be able to see as well, they can't see everything that they would like to see. And so the ability to be able to, again, I go back to the sharing agreements, having partners that we can share information with, that they don't have the, the PRC backbone uh, for technology and their telecommunications, and then being able to uh, make them aware of that. So we're very innovative. So I could talk about traditional uh, ISR, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, traditional, uh, but then we have been very successful, I think, in uh, Southcom. We don't sit around and just uh, wait for someone to give us something. We, we <laughs> figure out innovative and, uh, you know, how do we, how do we uh, uh, come up with some uh, ideas and approaches ourselves and whatever technology is uh, out there. And I think we've been very successful in doing that. Congress has also uh, helped us out in terms of the ability to uh, provide uh, capability in place of military capabilities um, that is uh, not as good, but uh, uh, in, uh, it's a capability, and we, um, we certainly exploit that and take advantage of that and then look for uh, ways that we can expand it. And then, uh, as I said, the, the ability of our partners to be able to see, because working with like-minded democracies, sharing of the information, uh, what they see, what we see, and having that good connectivity is really what, what it's all about. Well, 
on the subject of regional partners, um, I guess taking a step back, how do you assess you know, efforts to build partner capacity, or that is build the capacities of our security military institutions of the, the partner countries with which you work? Um, when, when you think of success stories, which ones come to mind? Well, I could use I could use several, but uh, we've been a leader with our senior enlisted leader development program. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what makes our U.S. military so strong is our senior enlisted leaders and our enlisted force that's educated and understands their role, the importance of the Constitution for our country, for their country, um, uh, and the and. Uh, as we see the security challenges with the uh, uh, police of the, uh, our partner nations uh, that, are, that are dealing with these security challenges and the capabilities, but those militaries are being asked to help reinforce the police as they mm -hmm. try to counter these. And so their role in dealing with the population, which is not, you know, that's not their, their normal role. So, um, but I think that our senior enlisted leader program being mm -hmm. able to empower and educate first to empower that force. So when they are in small teams reinforcing election, the police with elections in their countries, which are so, so important. And in some cases so close as we've seen in uh, previous elections that have occurred with Colombia, mm -hmm. with Brazil, with Chile, yeah. um, I could go on and on. And so, um, and uh, uh, so, uh, that's uh, a, a program that has been very successful and very well received. I could take our Women, Peace, and Security program mm -hmm. uh, and the integration of women into public security forces and into the militaries has been uh, very well received. We've got a lot of women leaders in positions, presidents, prime ministers, vice presidents, ministers of defense. Uh, we have the only, uh, only female Chad right now, chief of defense that's mm -hmm. in Jamaica. I mean, we have uh, huge examples of many successful women. And so being able to highlight that program, and we're just rolling out a theater maintenance, uh, theater maintenance partnership initiative and uh, across the whole hemisphere. Uh, we're going to, uh, with the help of our partner nations, is from the tactical level at the individual operator level, all the way up to the institutional capacity building of logistics and sustainment. Um, it's hard for us in the U.S. military to do uh, logistics and sustainment, mm -hmm. and so I imagine it's hard yeah. for our partners. And mm -hmm. with our foreign military sales and our excess defense articles, and we have a lot of um, U.S. equipment that is in this hemisphere, and so we want that equipment not just to get it to them, but uh, help them in the ability to maintain it, keep it ready so they can actually use it and counter the security challenges. Well, if I can um, follow on, because uh, you mentioned women, peace, and security, and we actually have a couple of questions from the audience about that. Um, Joanna Lane from the U.S. Embassy Bogota asks, uh, what are your objectives with respect to gender equality within Latin American military forces, and what obstacles do you see that impede progress towards achieving those goals? So the, uh, every trip I do, I do a Women, Peace, and Security event. So my little small uh, office of three in my headquarters at Southcom uh, is traveling all the time because they're putting on amazing events and, uh, and uh, opportunities for us to highlight. We bring together um, all women in the, uh, that, that we can for an event, and we bring the leaders together too. And we talk about their barriers uh, to opportunities, their mm -hmm. barriers to... Um, be able to uh, be more successful in the in their roles and so um, just being able to hear that and hear how articulate they are smart mm -hmm. um, but it's not just having women there it's also having the you know their their colleagues yeah. and uh, being able to provide what they see and then all of us leaders be able to hear that mm -hmm. and um, and I think it's just the continued press and then also you know, the, uh, the, the old saying of you can't be what you can't see right. um, is very true sometimes. And so, uh, but there are many examples. They're doing great in the hemisphere. And, uh, but we have to continue to uh, show them that they've got to uh, uh, create the opportunities. In my mind, from Richardson's perspective, it's all, always about the opportunity. If you don't mm -hmm. allow someone the opportunity and have 50% of your talent pool be able to participate, and be able to raise the level and the readiness level of military and security forces, um, then uh, we're, we're, 
that's a barrier. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we got to realize that because we shouldn't be surprised when the opportunities are opened, how well women do. Right. Well, and it's interesting how many of the, the, the topics and issues you're working with, it moving forward and progress is very much about removing barriers to collaboration, um, you know, gender collaboration, uh, gender opportunity, interagency collaboration. It's just very interesting that that, that seems to be the theme that, of, of um, that, that, that you're running into uh, uh, quite a lot. Right. And it's, uh, but it's good for the leaders to be able to hear that. I mean, there, yeah. there's, you talk yeah. about flattening all the layers and, and uh, you know, the folks that are right there on the front lines being able to communicate with their leaders and talk mm -hmm. about uh, the things that uh, are impeding their success or being from, uh, from being more successful, mm -hmm. uh, I think is a huge benefit. Mm -hmm. Well, if I can jump in here with a few audience questions, yeah. and Kathleen, I'll ask you to do the same. Um, this first one from our live audience comes from Alice Zhang from Voice of America. Uh, and she asks, she notes that A Data recently published a report that explores the potential for China to establish permanent overseas naval bases. So we've seen it in Djibouti, there's consideration in Sri Lanka and UAE elsewhere. So what does that look like in Latin America? Will China set up a military base there in the near future? If so, where, where and when? And then what are those military and strategic consequences for the United States? Yeah, so the uh, great question. Thanks, Alice. Uh, and the, uh, to go back to the investment, uh, what looks to be investment by the Chinese in critical infrastructure in, uh, in all of these countries. And uh, when you're talking about deep water ports, telecommunications, safe city, smart city technology, uh, and also space infrastructure, if I just take deep water ports, I'd take the Panama Canal. There's five state-owned, Chinese state-owned enterprises along the Panama Canal. And so what do I worry about is the, is the uh, being able to use it for dual use, not just civilian use, but flip it around and use it for military application. So why, is the, why are the Chinese uh, investing so much in the critical infrastructure in this hemisphere? Why do they do it in Africa? I see that uh, the Western Hemisphere is about five to seven years behind Africa. They've done it uh, other places other than just Africa and in the Western Hemisphere before. Uh, and, but why? Why with the biggest uh, uh, increase in conventional nuclear forces on mainland China is there such investment going on in, the, in this region? And so um, absolutely concerned about it. And then if you take the Panama Canal and what the Panama Canal means to the global economy, and then the other uh, strategic sea line of communication that I have in the Southcom AOR is the Strait of Magellan. <coughs> and also uh, the PRC building capability uh, in these waterways and along uh, the opening and along the way on these waterways. Uh, yeah, and so I worry about the flipping of, and using it for military application. There's not a Chinese uh, base yet in, the, in this hemisphere, uh, but uh, I see with all of this critical infrastructure uh, investment with these BRI projects that uh, there could possibly be someday. And that includes Cuba as well. That does. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question from uh, the audience. Um, how, Kristen White asks, how are you and Southcom broadly viewing climate change as a security challenge? Uh, can you provide any examples of events or disruptions you're seeing as a result of climate change? And how has it impacted the movement of peoples in the region? Well, as we were talking about earlier with migration and climate change and uh, the severity of storms, uh, the frequency of storms are getting stronger, they're more frequent. And so we have to, the five lines of effort, the climate ad adaptation plan that Department of Defense has developed. I've got some seed money for, you know, just starting out with climate change and being able to uh, put that to use. That's why it was important for me to travel with uh, Administrator Nelson and see that joint project that NASA has with USAID that was going on in Cali and, uh, and what space can provide to help with climate change uh, with the countries. And so we will carry that forward to be able to see if uh, the implementation across uh, the region because we have that thousand mile drought, uh, drought corridor in the hemisphere. Argentina, when I was just there uh, in April, they are struggling with uh, an unprecedented drought that has occurred. Chile had a once in a thousand year fires the entire month of February uh, that we were able to help them with a, being able to share imagery and share where, so they could help predict where the fires were gonna continue to go as well as do some humanitarian 
uh, assistance donations that the U.S. Ambassador was able to do as a result of uh, some of that ODACA funding that, uh, w that we have access to from Department of Defense and Congress. So we have, you know, Carrie mentioned it and Kathleen, you mentioned it, you know, just in terms of the, all of these things that Southcom is able to help countries with when they have crises. We may not be asked, you know, we support USAID and in terms of if there's a, a formal request by a country for assistance, but we don't wait till we get formally asked. We're thinking, okay, how do we, part we help our partner nations? What can we do with what's out there right now uh, to help team democracy and help our teammates uh, get through this uh, chaos that they're going through. Well, and that reminds me is there's so much that our military does and supports that you don't see but are so mm -hmm. consequential. So on the humanitarian mm -hmm. front, USNS Comfort. Right. Can you just talk a little bit more about how are we engaging in the region on, on those fronts that, yeah, that you absolutely. don't necessarily see? So and, I have, uh, we're constantly doing, other than having the, you know, you can't beat the USNS uh, hospital ship, the Comfort. And we had the Comfort in the, in the region uh, going to five countries last October through December. And that was off the charts amazing. Um, but I was not able to get the Comfort this year. So, okay, so we didn't get it. So, we, uh, so we're, we're taking one of, our, um, one of our two littoral combat ships that I get allocated. Uh, uh, and so we're going to put uh, innovative capability that we discovered. It's called Clinic in a Can. And we're gonna put these clinics that we're able to roll off the ship when it comes into port and set those up just like we do with the, with the Comfort and do those uh, set up uh, activities, several uh, clinics that were able to provide different sorts of just quality of life uh, treatment for our partners. But we're constantly, JTF Bravo, Joint Task Force Bravo is a brigade size element that has been, uh, the, it's my most forward deployed entity. It's out of Sotocano in Honduras. And they have uh, uh, helicopters that provide immediate disaster response uh, for hurricanes at an iota, I could say, uh, the earthquake in Haiti the, a couple of years ago in 2021. And uh, they're right there. They have a, a medical capability. We do medical exercises all the time, clinics. We do eye clinics. We do mm -hmm. surgery clinics. This also keeps up the uh, surgical skills of our, um, of our military medical providers to be able to uh, do things in combat. So it's mm -hmm. a win-win, right. uh, but we're constantly doing that. We just don't wait till there's a big hospital ship that's able to come into the hemisphere. I'd like to get it every year, uh, and the CNO knows that. Uh, so I continue to, to work that, and, uh, and Secretary Del Toro from the Secretary of Navy has been very helpful, traveled in the region numerous times. Uh, but those capabilities of the soft power, the humanitarian assistance, being able to do that, we're working right now, uh, uh, Bailey Bridges, a bridge capability, because Colombia, Ecuador, and Panama have had severe flooding from El Nino. You're either getting the drought from El Nino or you're getting the flooding. Mm -hmm. And so many bridges have been knocked out going to indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. That also creates a problem with farm to market for their farmers. Mm -hmm. And so you think of, you know, it's just how can we help them? And uh, it's, again, we're just limited by our, our ideas of how mm -hmm. we can help. And so it's to the big military kind of things with the hard power, but a lot of how do we get after that soft power and help our partners through their challenges. Well, we are just about out of time, uh, but as the director of the Smart Room and Smart Power program at CSIS, I can't, I can't resist the opportunity to ask you the question. Um, do you think that being a woman has affected how you approach your decisions and, and your leadership style as the combatant commander of United States Southern Command? If so, why, if not, why not? Well, I think the, uh, just the, the skill sets that women bring to the table, and uh, as I said before, about 50% of the talent pool, um, being able to uh, build teams, uh, solve things, uh, always bringing the team together, how can we figure this out, and, um, and try to find uh, workable, peaceful solutions that, you know, you gotta listen to your partners. I think mm -hmm. that's a really big thing, mm -hmm. is to be a good listener, and you gotta be able to understand their challenges through their eyes, not, not my eyes. That's not how they see things. I need to fully understand how they see it, and I think that's, you know, just that uh, intuitive um, interest, uh, being able to understand through 
another uh, country, humans, eyes, there are challenges that they have. And so I think that um, uh, I'm glad to say I might be the first woman commander of Southcom, but I won't be the last. <laughs> so I'm um, really excited for that. So, Well, thank you so much for joining us for this incredibly rich discussion this morning. Uh, we really appreciate the time. Your, your schedule is so, so jam-packed. So we're very grateful that you were able to spend some time with us this morning. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.